A long-standing joke about the craft brewing industry is that it's full of white dudes with beards. You've heard that one before, Taplines listener. Like all great jokes, especially the ones that make humorless chuds mad, there's a kernel of truth there. Even today, two plus decades in the American craft brewing boom, it's still a fairly homogenous industry. So you can imagine what it was like when Terry Farendorf, fresh from Chicago's storied Siebel Institute, pulled on her first pair of boots and hit the brew house floor in the late 80s. Times have changed plenty since then, and the United States' third ever female brewmaster has done plenty to change them. In 2007, after 18 years in breweries and brew pubs in California and Oregon, Terry decided to try something new, hitting the road as an itinerant brewer for an odyssey spanning thousands of miles, dozens of brewery collaborations and visits, and a third of a year. Along the way, she met with other female brewers like her, and they all wanted a way to connect with their colleagues, to find community as women working in a male-dominated industry. Armed with an email list and a pair of cheap pink boots gifted to her before her departure, Terry began laying the groundwork for what would become, of course, the Pink Boot Society. Today she joins Taplines to tell the tale of her long career in the American beer business and the winding road that led her to found what would become the beer industry's leading professional advocacy group for women and non-binary people. It's Terry Farendorf, it's a brewing road trip for the ages, it's the grassroots origin of the Pink Boot Society, and it's all right here right now on Vine Pairs Taplines. On the road again, welcome Taplines listeners. You are here for a very special episode of our show. We're joined today by Terry Farendorf, who is, of course, the road brewer, as some know her, but as many others know her, maybe equally, maybe even even more, uh, uh, as the founder of the Pink Boots Society. Terry, thank you so much for joining us today on Taplines. Welcome to the show. Happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Terry, where are you joining us from today? I'm joining you from my home in Portland, Oregon. And for those Taplines uh, listeners who are also Taplines viewers, um, you'll see the lovely artwork that Terry, you've got behind you. Do you, you made this artwork, at least some of it, right? Some of it. Yeah. The small, uh, pictures on this side with the beers and some of them still need beers painted in. I, I did paint those. Yes. You got some empty pint glasses. You'll have to fill them, uh, at some <laughs> later date with your artistic visions of paint. What kind of beers will you fill them with? Uh, it depends on what contrasts well with the background colors. So it could be a lighter beer, it could be a darker beer. I don't know yet. <laughs> we'll have to see. Stay tuned. But for now, uh, we have a lot of business to take care of. Of course, we had you on uh, tap on today because I think for many, uh, even craft beer enthusiasts, even those who are not in the industry, are familiar with the current iteration, the contemporary iteration of of the Pink Boot Society. And I mean, based on the breadth of the organization and where it is has gone in, in, you know, in, uh, uh, the time since you founded it. Um, I think many people probably assume that it's, uh, been around for a whole lot longer than it actually has. I mean, we're talking about, uh, uh, several dozen, maybe up to, I think the counts up around 75 chapters, several international chapters. Um, you know, I think, uh, if you're a, a woman or a non-binary brewer in this country, you have, encountered it in a professional context before but this was this is a relatively new development and today you're here to talk about where that development started where that uh where this this organization um began so we're happy to have you and if if you're ready to go we're gonna scroll the tap lines time machine back to what where should we set it to like 2006 ish or so yeah, 2006, 2007 really is when Pink Boot Society started. Let's do it. Let's go back to the beginning. So, uh, Time machine. Yes, thank you. Whoa, that is perfect. <laughs> thank you. Normally, I just... I, <laughs> exactly, exactly right. All right, so we're smash cut back to the mid-aughts. Terry, uh, you're, you're working, you're brewing. Give us a little bit of context of where you were, you know, in the direct run-up to... Um, you know, what would become the Pink Boot Society? Well, uh, I had been a brewmaster for 19 years on the West Coast, uh, first down in California and then in Eugene, Oregon. Mm. And then with my job at Steelhead Brewing Company, where I was for 17 years, um, I, um, I built five breweries for them, one in Eugene and four in California. 
But after a while, you kind of run out of challenges. And so I was just ready for a change of pace. Um, but I wasn't ready to fall in love with another company. So I left Steelhead Brewing Company and I was trying to figure out what to do next. I was going to take a little break. And my husband, um, I mentioned to my husband that I'd always had this fantasy about going on a road trip and visiting all my professional peers because, you know, your best friends are other brewers and brewmasters and you only get together a couple times a year maybe to judge the Great American Beer Festival or the World Beer Cup sure. or to exhibit at a, a festival or like the Craft Brewers Conference. So I wanted to connect all those dots across the country and um, visit them all. And I thought, wouldn't it be so fun to brew with them? And my husband said, that's a perfect trip for you and you should do it. So um, in 2007, I left uh, my job in March. And then it took me a little while to kind of get geared up for the trip. I left on, I think, June 4th, 2007. Mm -hmm. And um, during that lead up time, I was preparing for my trip, figuring out what it was going to look like. Um, I decided to visit relatives on weekends and breweries during the week. And I ended up buying a bigger camper because the current camper that I had at the beginning that I'd had forever um, didn't have a bathroom in it. And I realized I'm not going to be in the woods where I can pee behind a tree at night. Right. I'm going to be, I'm going to be, you know, for example, I'm in Brooklyn, New York, you know, <laughs> visiting uh, Garrett Oliver on sure. this trip. And where am I going to pee behind a tree? So uh, they don't take kindly to that in Brooklyn, New York. No, yeah. It's a little different. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, I knew I'd be going in cities and I would be parking in brewery parking lots so um, I got a bigger camper. And during that time, I was thinking about my experience as a brewmaster. When I went for Steelhead, I was building new breweries in California. Mm -hmm. It would get to be about a month before we expected the brewery to be done. So I would take delivery of the equipment, get it hooked up, and then start brewing. But when I always landed you know, on site at the construction site and walked in... The construction guys would go, well, little lady, are you lost? And I'd put on my big girl voice and I'd say, I'm your brewmaster and I'll be working you with you guys for the next <laughs> couple of months. And they'd say, Good why? We don't, have a, we don't have a residency permit or whatever, uh, occupancy permit yet. And I said, doesn't matter. I said, you got, and then there'd be some guy tiling the bathroom and I'd go, get back in the brewery. We got to brew the beer before you can pee it. I need that brewery <laughs> tile first. And so these kinds of conversations. So I was thinking, okay, when I go on this road trip and I'm going to visit all my brewing friends, plus I'm going to visit as many breweries along the route as I can. Um, I thought I'm going to be seeing people who have never met a woman brewmaster before because there mm. weren't very many of us. I was the third woman brewmaster in the, in the United States, certainly wow. since Prohibition. And so um, I knew I would walk in and people would be doing, the, hey, little lady, are you lost? And um, and I thought the thing is that once I open my mouth and start, start speaking beer lingo, I'm one of the boys. But I mm -hmm. felt like I was representing my gender. And I thought, you know what? The one piece of safety equipment that every brewer wears is rubber boots. And I mentioned to my husband, you know, I wish I had a pair of pink rubber boots. And then he mentioned it to his mom. And just before I left on the trip, this box arrives with a pair of pink rubber boots inside. Now, I had been going on the Brewers Association forum asking who wants me to visit them and trying to connect the dots across yeah. the country. And I mentioned I had this pair of pink rubber boots. So... I pack up, <clears throat> I leave. My first visit is Deschutes Brewery in Bend, Oregon. I'm there at six in the morning and I'm getting on my brewing uniform that I had worn for 19 years, which was basically a white, you know, Mr. Goodwrench jumpsuit type sure. jumpsuit. I'm looking at those boots, the black boots I've worn forever and those bubblegum pink boots that were so gaudy and so bright and I couldn't do it. I put on the black boots and I went inside and the brewer said, Hey, we heard you were going to be wearing pink boots. Where are they? I'm like, they're in the camper. They're like, we've never seen pink boots. Go put them on. And I realized everybody <laughs> wanted to see these boots. So I blogged the whole trip at roadbrewer.com. 
And um, I made sure, I mean, this is before everybody took like a million pictures at every right, stop. Right. I just took one picture at every stop. And I made sure those pink boots were in the picture with the brewer that I was brewing with that day. And that's actually where the name came from because I was on this trip and I started thinking of it as the pink boots tour because I was wearing these boots and people were commenting on them. And in fact, I showed up. Uh, down to visit uh, Tommy Arthur's place in in uh, San Diego area, and I walked in and I'm working there for the day. And one of the regulars came in and say, "Hey, you're the Pink Boots lady. I just found your uh, blog last night. I'm following you now." And I thought, "Oh, now I'm the Pink Boots lady." So it all just kind of came in to play in the what the ultimate name of this group would be. Yeah, I love that. Man, so 19 years, you were looking for a new challenge. You'd spent 17 of those years at Steelhead. And, you know, when you, you know, when you were deciding what to do next, this road trip, were people making those types of, like, beer pilgrimages at the time or, like, sojourns at the time? Like, how typical, in other words, was this type of behavior, like packing up into a camper and going around from brewery to brewery? As far as I know, I was the first one to do a big road trip like that. I mean, mine was 139 days, which is almost five months. I visited 71 breweries. I brewed at 38 of them. Nobody was doing anything like that at the time. Yeah, yeah. We didn't even have smartphones. No, I know. A GPS unit was $1,000. Yeah. So I was calling and getting directions and putting on a yellow pad of paper and trying to read it while I'm driving a van with a camper behind me (laughs) across the road. I mean, across the whole country. So, I mean, it was the technology was completely different. Tell me a little bit about the the Brewers Association forums that you mentioned. I mean, that was, it sounds like a point of connection where you were networking with folks that you maybe had met before at CBC or GBF, GABF. Maybe you hadn't met some of them. How did you decide which stops you wanted to make? Were you talking to folks on the forum and kind of, you know, triangulating from there? Yeah, um, somebody would... I put it up on the forum that I'm looking for landing spots between here and here. And uh, does anybody want me to come visit them? Yeah, yeah. And uh, this actually played into how Pink Boot Society came about because there were obviously my friends that I connected with along the way. But then there were breweries that were inviting me and I didn't know anyone there, which I thought was cool that I had these boots so that when I went in and I talked, lingo and we all became bros together you know talking about beer that they would recognize i'm I'm still a woman you know yeah and so um so all these people were saying hey we'd love for you to visit and so i would connect with them and i'd add it to my list and i actually tried to visit everywhere that wanted me um except for uh, there weren't enough breweries in the deep south at the time for me to head down there sure so i ended up going um from portland uh down into let's see where did i go i went down to san diego and then i went up to um denver so that i could attend the the what was that that would have been spring so that was the homebrews conference i think at that time and then across the country to maine and then down above pennsylvania and then across the country to denver again to judge the great american beer festival and then it's interesting. They say when you turn a horse toward home, he just wants to get to the barn. Once I turned around <laughs> in Pennsylvania and started heading west again, I was planning to go over to Santa Rosa and vin- visit uh, Vinny and Natalie Chalorzo at sure. Russian River. But by the time I got to Denver, I'm like, you know what? It's been like 130 days or more. I'm I'm ready to go home. You've been out so on the road. So then I just headed back yeah. to here. Of course, listener, uh, you may remember Natalie Chalurzo from an earlier episode of Taplines. We spoke to Natalie about her uh, experience sort of at the forefront of what would become craft brewing line culture, where people line up for uh, Pline of the Pline of the Younger and, and wait for uh, pours of that triple IPA that uh, Vinny Chalurzo had sort of, you know, uh, uh, created and pioneered and it became so hyped. So go back and have a listen to that listener if you have not yet. But Terry, I want to hear a little bit more about these, the, the obviously not the most important part, but I am curious, the boots themselves, like, were, was this <laughs> like, a, was this a custom job or what? Well, actually, um, people will buy rain boots or like gardening boots, yeah. but these were rain boots. So there was no steel toe in them. They were fairly cheaply made. Um, and so 
I wore them for every visit all the way across the country and took pictures and put the picture up on my blog. And now those boots are actually in the Hops and Beer Archive with the University of Oregon down in Corvallis. And they are an artifact in the Hops and Brewery Archive uh, at the university. And they actually made it into a um, museum show here up in Portland at the um, Oregon Historical Society Museum. They had an exhibit on craft beer in Oregon and the Pacific Northwest, and they had a little um, exhibit about Pink Boots Society with my boots cool. in a box, in a glass box in the display. It was kind of cool. How did they How did they look? They, like, did, did they hold they up by terrible. the end of this tree? Yeah, I was going to say, they got to be pretty beat <laughs> up, right? <laughs> Cheap. <laughs> <laughs> And they're discolored and they're getting really funny colored. They're yeah, kind of yeah. terrible. And uh, I have nicer pink boots now that are actually chemical resistant and have a steel toe right. and a steel shank that are actually designed for industrial use. I love it. Good. <laughs> That's good. Steel toe is important. Chemical resistance is important. Of course, Taplines listener technology has come a long way since 2007, but they had that stuff in 2007 too. Uh, you were risking it, Terry, to rep uh, rep the pink boots. You were you were out there and uh, and making it work with maybe maybe not OSHA approved uh, equipment here and there. True, true. <laughs> um, so Terry, in in 2000, you know, like you said, 19 years uh, of a career before you go on what would become this formative journey. Um, I was in. English major in college myself. I love the idea of an odyssey that you went on. Uh, you know, there's there's this sort of arc of the hero, so to speak. Um, you were the protagonist in, in the story of what would become Pink Boot Society. Um, tell us a little bit about in 2007 or even, you know, further back when you first were starting in the industry, I mean, you described sort of the experience of jawing with construction workers who who didn't really make you for a brewmaster. And then you'd kind of have to, you know, earn a place in the conversation by demonstrating your, your competency and your lingo. I have to imagine that was a fairly common experience for you, even in 2007, and then surely, you know, prior, I'm hoping you can maybe characterize for listeners who many of whom, you know, are, are, uh, you know, are coming at, uh, the industry as, you know, younger entrants to the industry that are, have joined once there maybe is more of, uh, a diverse, slightly more diverse workforce contextualize a little bit about sort of what you were seeing when you were, when you were starting out and, and up through the, the midway point through the aughts. Well, at the beginning, I mean, nobody knew what to do with me. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I, the informational interviews because everybody's like, Oh, we're not hiring. And, and I mean, let's face it. When I graduated from Siebel in 1988, yep. there was about 50 craft breweries in the country and about 50 regional slash mega breweries in the country. There really was, were very, very few jobs. Yeah. And so, um, um, you know, there were, Clearly, people who didn't even want to interview me mm -hmm. would ask funny questions like, can you carry a full half barrel of beer up, up a flight of steps? I said, no, I'm, I'm smart, though, and I would figure out how to get it up there. The interesting thing is, and sometimes this still happens, is that there are certain people who are interviewing who are not asking the right questions. They're mm. asking, can you do this job this way? And this way is the way they, as a man, are used to doing it. Now, the better question is, here is a keg of beer. It's at the bottom of the steps. It needs to get to the top of the steps. How would you get it there? And I guarantee you the answer that you're going to get from a woman is a safer answer. And so <laughs> anybody who seriously wants to have a safe brewery should have a woman brewer do a safety audit and don't tell them how you're doing it now or how you want it done. Ask them, how would you do this job? And the answer is going to be a safe answer. And so I was getting a lot of, say, those types of questions. Can you do this this way? And I'd say, no, but I can do it this other way, which is always safer because I still have a good back and I still have good knees because I didn't try to overstrain myself when sure. I was new in the industry, whereas a lot of guys, they go to the gym, right? And so they're just going to try to just muscle it out. And now they're like, Ugh, I can't yeah. do that job anymore. Beat so up their bodies. Anyway, yeah, yeah, sure. There were, there were funny questions. And what's 
funnier about those funny questions is that those men who asked me those funny questions then are good friends of mine now. And so they would be mortified if I ever brought these questions up to the end. Do you remember before we actually met in person, you asked me these silly questions over the phone? Um, <laughs> they probably wouldn't even remember it. They would have blocked it out because they know me now. And I have had uh, men tell me that they have hired women brewers because they knew me and they knew I could do the job. But the bottom line came down to what did my beer taste like? That was the most important thing. So to give you an example, my very first job, uh, paid job out of Siebel, um, which, by the way, they only paid me half of my paychecks. They bounced their asses. It's like, yeah, there's dramas all along the way. Oh, jeez. But <laughs> we won't go into that. Um, but um, I told them, I said, uh, you know, we one of the traditions we had, which has kind of fallen off, I'd love to see it come back, is when you open a new brewery, you have a big party and you invite all the local brewers to come in and taste your first beers. So I was at this brewery. And I invited the local brewers to come in and taste my beers. And um, one of them said, one of them who used to work at that exact brewery said, wow, your first beers are as good as my best beers. And that was pretty awesome. And I could tell when they were all men, of course, when they came in, they were all just kind of like, you know, until they tasted my beers. Skeptical, skeptical of you. Yeah, yeah. Correct. And then... Um, Thank you for translating for those who don't have the video. <laughs> I'm, I'm here talking with my hands because that's what I do. But to a person, they came up before they left and shook my hand. And I didn't realize it till that moment. But that was when I was initiated into the old Brewers Network, which I didn't even know existed. But clearly there's the home brewers and the wannabes. And then there is the old Brewers Network, which is the professional brewers that are making professional level, level beer. And I got initiated with all those handshakes in 1989. Yeah. Very so that cool. Was pretty cool. And then ever since then, people, well, maybe some people doubted me, but... You know, when somebody doubts me, that just makes me go, hmm, let me prove them wrong. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, right on. So were there a lot of, you said you were the third brewmaster in the country, female brewmaster in the country, excuse me. Were there a lot of even female workers at any level of like production brewing at that time? Like what was the, the rest of the workforce brewery. like? The big breweries had some. I know um, in 2007, I visited Anheuser-Busch, and they were big on hiring female chemical engineers mm. um, because, you know, when you get to be that big, you definitely have equal opportunity quotas that you need to be thinking about. Uh, but the interesting thing is that as much as probably Anheuser-Busch pays, they didn't pay female chemical engineers as much as they could get somewhere else being a chemical engineer. Is that right? Off yeah, apparently. So quite often they didn't stay forever. Um, there, you know, over the years, as I said, I started in 1988 and then I left Steelhead in 2007. Between those years, I would see like a woman come into the beer industry and after a few years she would leave. And here's the thing. I didn't think too hard about it. I would think, oh, well, maybe mm. she wants to be a dental hygienist now. But in thinking back, I think, I wonder if maybe she wasn't getting the kind of support she needed and pink boots has given people women and non-binary the support that they need and so therefore the industry is not seeing that kind of turnover of women that it was seeing prior to pink boots being around yeah i think that's always such an interesting and like important point to stress about you know there are certainly uh, political opponents of diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives, and you know you'll hit you'll hear all the talking points, of course. But what you often, if you actually go out and do the reporting, if you actually talk to you know uh, the companies that are implementing these types of programs, of course, Pink Boot Society is its own organization; it's not a DEI effort within a company, but it is of a piece with that broader, I think, uh, uh, push to have a more diverse workforce. What you'll often hear from the companies themselves is like, well, we're doing this because like we need a labor pipeline that is qualified and is reliable. And we're not, you know, if we were just looking 
in with one you know in one demographic or one cohort of of uh, of you know the hiring pool we'd really be limiting ourselves we, we and we'd be burning our employees out because we're not understanding their needs et cetera et cetera so there are these like very like practical and like maybe a little unsexy silver linings to you know DEI of course I think you hear a lot of people who you know, see it for the sort of, you know, its ethical goals and its its ideals. And I think that stuff is important, certainly here at Taplines. We talk about that from time to time, done reporting on that before. But there's also just like the basic wear and tear of commerce on a workforce that, you know, like this is one of the ways that companies can proactively address it and and hopefully tamp down on some of the turnover that you're describing. Yeah, why limit yourself to 50% of the workforce yeah, right, at right. all? And maybe even less than 50% because there are a lot of men who are feminists as well who feel that women deserve to have their place as long as they qualify. Right. And and so why would you limit yourself? Also, I mean, just from experience, women communicate different, which means you're getting better communication when you're getting all kinds of communication, you know, male pattern communication or female pattern communication. Um, also women, I mean, it's not that men are not clever, but women, because they are not as brawny, um, they often have to be more clever. So I talked about the safety in the breweries, but also, um, you know, having a different kind of a brain thinking about your problems, you're going to come up with a broader range of solutions. And with any look, some very safe solutions to whatever the issues happen to be. I mean, here's just an idea. I mean, when you're in a brewery, a lot of breweries have the fermenters against a wall, and which means all the glycol pipes are behind the fermenters against the wall. If you have a big guy, he's not going to be climbing behind there if you have a glycol leak to fix it. But a woman who has smaller hands can sometimes climb, I have, you know, crawl underneath <laughs> the tank, and up behind there, and you're working like this, but you're changing out the solenoid, but a woman could get the job done, whereas sometimes the guy is too big to do that job. Yeah. So having people of various sizes, strength levels, cleverness levels, brain patterns, everything, uh, just makes for a better business. Yeah, 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 right on. So take us back. We, we talked in 2007. We went through the route a little bit. You know, we, uh, you're, you're, you know, you go down to California, then through Denver, then over the East Coast. We've talked about obviously the origin story of the boots themselves, which I was very curious about. So thank you for satisfying my curiosity there. Uh, you mentioned the F word just a moment ago, and I think this is a good opportunity to segue into this portion of the conversation. Um, in 2007, when you set off on that journey, did you conceive of this journey as an explicitly like feminist project? Was this something that you were thinking about at that time or no? Not at all. It was basically a way for me uh, to take a break between falling mm. in love with breweries, because you do when you're a brewer. And it was a break um, where I could visit my peers. And, and I mean, I've tasted their beers at conferences and festivals, but your beers are your children, and how do the children behave when they're at home? So I wanted to visit <laughs> them at their brewery and taste the beers at home. And I, my my aunts and uncles were getting older, and I wanted to see them, and they were spread out all across the country too. So that was the uh, initial impetus. And then with the boots, I thought that kind of keeps me in character as representing my gender when I'm walking on a brewery site and talking beer lingo and becoming one of the boys, you know. And what I noticed a pattern pretty quickly is that the people that invited me, when I get there, they say, oh, you're working with Laura today or you're working with Judy today or you're working with Dee Dee today. They were having me work with women for the day. Mm. And these women, I didn't know they existed and they had no idea that I existed. And quite often I would get the kind of response like, wait a minute, you're a woman and you've been a brewmaster for 19 years and I've never heard of you. And I've been working here for two or three years and I just thought it was a job, but maybe there's a career path for me and you could see these gears turning and I could feel like they really wanted to connect with me. Um, because they had never met another woman brewer. They thought they were the only one. Mm. And so that's kind of where the pink boots idea came from. I was visiting down at Stone Brewing and working with Laura Ulrich for the day. She ended up being the second president of Pink Boots Society after me. But I was working with her for the day, and she was like gobsmacked that there was another woman 
brewer in the world. And she'd been doing it for a while. And so uh, we had dinner that night. And the questions she asked were the questions I was hearing from other women later on in the trip. She was the first one. And the questions she asked were, how many women, you say there's other women in the beer industry, Terry, how many of us are there? There, And I said, I'm going on this trip. I will start taking <laughs> I'll names. find out, yeah. <laughs> I'll try to find out. Because, I mean, I was interviewed over the years here and there, and, and the interviewers would ask me, how many women brewers are there? Because it was such a novelty to interview me because I was the only one that those journalists had ever met. Right. And I and I said, I don't know, but if you find out, will you please call and tell me or whatever, email me? <laughs> and and uh, I mean, email was hardly a thing in 2007, honestly. Just a little bit of a thing. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, and so uh, I went on this trip and I would ask, everywhere I went, whether they had women working there or not, I said, do you know of any women brewers? Who are they? Um, and I would hear like rumors. Oh, I heard there's one in Indiana. Do you know her name? Nope. Get closer. <laughs> Hi, do you know of any women brewers? I heard there's one in Indiana. Yeah. Do you, do you know her name? No, but I heard she's in Bloomington. Okay, I guess I'm going to Bloomington. <laughs> You'll finally get there. Oh, it's Eileen Martin. Awesome. Go meet Eileen. <clears throat> so I created this list and people would say, oh, you know, there's Sister Doris in Germany. And so I, in Franconia, Germany, I have a Sister Doris goes on my list. And so everyone in the world I could find went on this list. And there ended up being uh, 60 women on this list by the time I got to Pennsylvania. So I got out to Pennsylvania and I'm having dinner with another woman with the exact same questions that Laura had given me. And she asked one more, who are they? I want to know. I want to network. I want to talk to them. Mm. Oh, is this where this is going? Okay. So then I was parked in front of Greg Noonan's house on his grass in his front yard. And I was there for a few extra days because I was trying to catch up on my blog. And by then I had started a website terryfarendorf.com because I would meet someone who had more experience than me. Great. I can learn something. And I would meet a different brewer with less experience than me. And I'd say, oh, you need my grain handling article from 1993. Or, oh, you need this article. Or, yeah. oh, I'll write an article about what you need. So I had a place to put all these articles I could write. So at any rate, this gal, Whitney from Pennsylvania, had asked for um, the list of names and so I, I said, I will put it on my website. So I'm typing it up. And at the top, I wrote list of women brewers. And I thought, oh, that's such a boring name. And lacks, I must it lacks up. pizzazz. Yeah. yeah. yeah <laughs> a little, 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 little procedure, a little procedural. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I got to backtrack for just a second, because when I quit my brewmaster job, I immediately had a, uh, an identity crisis. So I thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to go on this trip. I'm going to meet all these breweries and brewers and they're going to say, who are you? And I'm going to be, I'm nothing. I used to be a brewmaster. <laughs> so I, so I, I gave myself a title, the road brewer, because I was brewing on the road and that's where my blog is roadbrewer.com. Right. So at any rate, um, and, and that worked for me. I had a title. So I got, I'm building this website with all the names, the 60 names of the women that I had rounded up on this list and I'm going to post it on my website <clears throat> and I had listed women brewers and I thought that's such a boring name I thought well this is the pink boots tour because I'm wearing these boots and everybody seems to want to see them and pink is the quote girl color although I will tell you in ancient Rome pink was the color of little warrior boys sons of warriors is that because right it was called it was called light red yeah, yeah and red being the god of you know the color of mars the god of war if you wanted your boys to grow up tough you dressed them in light red that's pink <laughs> <laughs> but so, at this point it had become coded feminine so people were familiar did. with it and it people already knew you as the pink boots uh brewmaster who'd been making yeah. the rounds and, so, and I was thinking, you know, well, there's those little old ladies with the, the Red Hat Society. The little old ladies <laughs> like to get together yeah, and party yeah, yeah. and travel. Yeah, sure, sure. So I didn't think hard about it. I just put Pink Boots Society below that list of women brewers. And I grabbed some photos of boots to put on the page. And I put all the list and I put it up on my website. And I emailed Whitney and said, it's up. Next thing you know, I'm getting emails. It's like when you name yourself or you name your thing, it's like a lightning rod. It attracts attention. Sure. All of a sudden, I was getting media attention. Hi, I'm a blogger, and I just found your page. I'm going to 
put a link onto it or I'm going to repost it or, oh my gosh, I have a daughter and I'm a brewery owner. I'm so excited. And so, and these were men mostly. Then I got emails from women too. Hi, I am the packaging manager at Bell's Brewing Company. Hi, I am the lab manager at Ska Brewing. Can I join? And I'm like, I didn't know it was something you could join. Let me hang on to your email. <laughs> I didn't thought so, that. You hadn't thought that far ahead. <laughs> it's just a list of women brewers. I had no idea. So at any rate, but people wa- were really interested in it. They wanted, they wanted to join. So after I got back from this trip, um, the following Craft Brewers Conference was in San Diego. So I called Laura Ulrich and said, should we get the people on the women on the list together and have a meeting? Yes, let's do that. So she and uh, Jessica helped arrange at um, Gordon Biersch, um a luncheon. And it was great. They had pink tablecloths and pink flowers on the table. It's funny because I was never a pink girl growing up at all. That I, You know, it was, it was blue or yellow or green back then, right, you know, or red. right. You know, pink as, as like a little girl color is totally like a 1990s phenomenon. Um, but it wasn't that way when I was little. But anyway, this was super cute. And um, first time the women were getting together, they were so excited. They brought their beers to to share. That was when I first noticed that women's uh, speaking patterns are different than male. Um, but we can talk about that later. Anyway, so uh, we got that group together for that luncheon. And I said, uh, okay, ladies, we're going to vote. Um, I said, first of all, uh, do you want to be a group? Uh, No, I said, first of all, who are we? That's what I said. And they're like, well, Terry, look around. We're women brewers. I said, look again, we have six beer writers in this room. They have all asked to join. A lot of discussion. Um, The decision, a lot of discussion. Should we allow men? Lots of things. And I said, if we don't stand for something, we stand for nothing. Keep that in mind. So they voted to, I mean, it was a big discussion. Big breweries, small breweries, United States, the world, whatever. They decided any woman anywhere in the world who earns income from beer. So it's women, beer, professionals, those three things. Now, that has changed over time. It's not women and non-binary. It's not just beer. It's beer in any fermented beverage. So now it's beer, spirits, wine, kombucha, sake, and cider, or any other fermented beverages I don't know about. Yeah, yeah. Um, and See, then, uh, and then professional. At the time, you had to earn a small amount of ongoing income, but now it's twenty five percent of your income. Mm-hmm. They want to make sure you got skin in the game. Sure, you know. And so, it's 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 morphing in such a good way. But that's where it started because my background was beer, and I was a woman. That was my focus then. But the world has changed. However, I do think. That based on how many, getting back to your original question, how many women there were in the beer industry in 2007 versus how many women that are in the beer industry now, night and day, I do not think there would be as many women in the beer industry now without Pink Boots Society. Because sometimes you need to see someone who looks like you to be a role model before you can envision yourself in that role. So there are a lot of women beer professionals who are great role models. And so, um, you know, and I always envisioned that. I mean, I I didn't have the bandwidth to like, hey, let's go out to the high schools and like tell girls about the great career of fermentation. But that could be something that, (laughs) you know, Pink Boots takes on someday. There's only so much that I could personally, you know, grow it into. But it's, it's got a great, it's got super great roots Super, super sturdy, I feel, um, with its uh, organization. I mean, the funding is always kind of interesting with these nonprofits because it's only been 16 years. That's not long. No. That is not long. Yeah. Well, what I was going to say, Terry, is that you're always kind of towing a fine line if you go to high school and start telling kids about beer. Uh, you you got <laughs> to make, make sure you do that in the right way because otherwise... <laughs> That's totally fly in Wisconsin where I'm from, but maybe not in Arizona right, or something. Right, else. right. Uh, so Terry, uh, we've gone sort of the distance. We've traveled 
on the road with you. Uh, you've, you, ca- you came back to Portland. Um, then there was obviously sort of the formation of Pink Boots. But now come back to the present day for us. And, you know, you have gone in different directions of your career. We talked about your artwork. Uh, you and I were emailing. You, you now are working on um, a pottery project. You, you're just kind of, you seem to be a bit of a polymath. Uh, you've got a lot of interests, obviously. Pink Boot Society is just one part of your story, but I'm curious about sort of uh, how you reflect upon, I mean, this is not ancient history, but it's 16 years ago. Um, obviously, it, it grew into something that you never really expected it could. Um, where does Pink Boot Society as, as, a, as a story fit into uh, the Terry Farrandor story? Well, um, you know, maybe I couldn't have... Uh, dreamed for what it is now but I certainly had hopes for it or vice versa yeah I mean I really wanted it to be something um that could support women the original mission statement was to inspire encourage and empower women to basically expand their careers expand isn't the right word I can't remember (laughs) created to inspire encourage and empower women to whatever, jumpstart their careers to the next level sure. in the beer industry. And I can't remember the exact word it was. And and so, you know, the second major national meeting we did, we I, I brought up, what, you know, what are we, what is our goals? And I, and, you know, I used to just, I had what I call the thinking couch, right? I'd just lie on it and think about things. And I had to think about pink boots a lot because I have never been trained on, I'm not an admin, I'm a creative I'm not an admin. So yeah. here I am trying to create this organization because that's what the women voted on at the first meeting. They wanted an organization, not just an online list. And so what does it mean to be an organization? How can we be relevant to the entire industry? And, you know, if we just had a party once a year, it would it would have died by now. But Certainly. I felt like yeah, yeah. it had to be something that was bigger than any one of us that we could all get behind and push. And so I decided that we had to have goals that were big enough. So the goals I decided were, what about a scholarship program that would basically help our members bust through any glass ceilings? Now, I don't talk about gender-based glass ceilings because I don't care if they're there or not. We're going to bust through them. How are we going to bust through them? We're going to bust through them with education. We're going to get our members from one level. Let's say they're assistant brewer and they want to be a a brewmaster. How are they going to bust through that? You know, and if they don't bust through it at the place they're at now, well, they go get a job somewhere else somewhere and bust else. through it. Sure. And they're going to do it by getting the education. And so we started a scholarship program um, with the help of that mother-in-law that sent me the pink boots. We're able to get uh, um, a 501c3 tax exempt charity status through the IRS. That took me four years. Wow. I'm not, I'm not a lawyer. That was a 98 page application. I'm not an administrator. I hate sitting in front of a computer. <laughs> I'm an artist. I build with my hands. I build beer for 19 years and now I build ceramic sculpture. That's what I do. I use my hands. So some people just are not built for a cubicle life. I'm one of them. Right on. So so Pink Boot Society, um, you know, we, we're doing scholarships like crazy. We have this huge program where we are raising um, money through our collaboration brew days. Um, Yakima Chief is, has been awesome and they've designed a Pink Boots blend a hop for about seven years, maybe going on eight, I think. And actually all the Pink Boots members get together and do hop rubs and put together the blend. So it's the members who actually choose that hop. That the hop blend is a pellet blend and it is sold, I think, in two ounce packs for homebrew shops. And it's sold in 11 or 44 pound boxes all over the world um and um women uh get together um and some men too join us you know what the heck and so they do these collaboration brews where they design a beer together and then they'll sell the beer and some of that money goes back to pink boot society for the scholarship program and the bulk of it comes from yakima chief hops and country malt group which which sells and distributes the Yakima Chief hops. So through those two companies, that's the major portion of our funding for our scholarship program. And I don't know the exact number, so don't quote me, but I think it's around 40 or so scholarships a year. Wow. um, Fantastic. All over the world. And our very first scholarship was to a woman in Sweden who at the time could not bust out of being an assistant brewer. With the training she was able to get, 
which was the Siebel Concise course in brewing technology out of Chicago online. She was able to get enough training to get herself up to a brewmaster level, and now she's a brewery owner. So this tells me that Pink Boot Society's scholarship program works. Now, as the founder, I'm sitting there on my thinking couch going, okay, a couple people are going to get scholarships. We're going to end up with all these members. How do the other members benefit if only a couple, a handful are getting these scholarships? So I invented this thing, which I call Pay It Forward or PIF. And I am now the PIF coach, Pay It Forward coach. Okay. So, and we never call them scholarship winners. They are scholarship recipients because if you have a winner, that means the other applicants were losers. No, there are no losers in Pink Boot Society. Trust me, zero. So the, any scholarship recipients who need to pay it forward, I can be the coach with that. So every scholarship recipient is required to either write an article about something specific they learned. Let's say... Let's say Jessica with her, you know, the concise course in brewing technology from Siebel, she might have chosen, let's say, oh, I want to talk about the Krebs life cycle of yeast. And so she could go do a deep dive, do some more research, put together an article. You have your choice of getting it published, or you could give a talk like at the Craft Brewers Conference. Part of the reasoning behind this is because not only um, do does it take Basically, to become a leader in today's society, you have to be able to speak succinctly in public and you have to be able to write succinctly for publication. This is how you become a leader. But also, I wanted to fill the pipeline of New Brewer Magazine, other technical brewing magazines, Craft Brewers Conference, Master Brewers Association of the Americas Conference. I wanted to fill those pipelines with speakers and writers with women. Awesome. Yeah, that's, man, you were thinking so strategically even at the very beginning of this. Oh, yes. And luckily, my DNA and fingerprints are still all over Pink Food Society, <laughs> even though I'm not running it. Well, uh, thank you, Terry, <laughs> so much for joining us today on Tap Lines. It's a hell of a story, and it all started with those cheap pink boots without the steel toe and that camper van that you upgraded to with a bathroom <laughs> in it because you didn't want to pee in the woods. Thank you again so much for coming on to Tell the Tale. Okay, I appreciate it so much. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Taplines is recorded in Richmond, Virginia, and produced by yours truly and Darby Seaside, who, along with the talented Shane Ferrick, composed our delightful soundtrack. Just listen to it. I also want to give a quick shout out to the entire Vine Pear team, and especially co founders Adam Teeter and Josh Mallon, editor in chief Joanna Sherino. Managing Editor Tim McCurdy, and Art Director Danielle Grinberg, who designed our lovely Taplines logo. And of course, a big thank you to you, yes you listener, for spending time with us week in and week out. We literally couldn't do this without you. I'm Dave Infante, and I'll catch you next time. <laughs>